may not be simple, but a cure for cancer is at hand. Dr. Gary Gilliland from the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. Dr. Gilliland, is the introduction right? Is a cure for cancer at hand? Well, I believe so. I'm very excited about this more than I've ever been in my 30-year career in cancer research and treatment that we're beginning to see curative therapies for diseases that we thought could not even be touched with conventional types of approaches to treatment. The words I keep hearing are, are CAR-T. What does that mean? CAR-T stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And that's one of the strategies that we're using to try to develop curative treatments for cancer. They all focus on harnessing the power of our body's own immune system to fight cancer against the realization that the immune system can be very powerful for fighting cancer, just as it's powerful for fighting infections with viruses, with bacteria, with parasites. We learned at the Hutch um, nearly 40 years ago when we were uh, when we were founded as an institution studying bone marrow transplantation, that one of the most important parts of the transplant in terms of being curative, um, and, it, and it is a curative therapy, was not the chemotherapy or the radiation therapy that was used to treat the cancer or the leukemia, but the donor's immune system was critically important for fighting cancer and keeping it at bay and having long-term curative intent. And that's what we've been aiming to do for the last 40 years uh, that's why our tagline is cures start here. We're not aiming to simply treat cancer. We're looking for ways to cure it. And these CAR T cells are one approach for harnessing the immune system. And, and this was developed here by several fantastic investigators, Stan Riddell, uh, Dr. Phil Greenberg, and Dr. David Maloney runs the clinical trials um, mm -hmm. up at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And the way it works, Stan, is just really remarkable when you look at the technological advances. You take T cells out of a uh, patient uh, by withdrawing them by vein, purify them, these immune cells, and then over a period of about 10 to 14 days, those cells are genetically re-engineered and reprogrammed to kill the specific cancer that the patient has. We first started with this with bloodborne cancers like acute lymphoblastic leukemia mm -hmm. and targeted um, protein that's expressed on the surface of those cells. We taught, we educated the T cells using genetic manipulations, how to identify those leukemia cells and to destroy them. And the results have just been stunning. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career where people who had had bone marrow transplantation and relapsed, people who had not responded to mm -hmm. any of the therapies that we had and had weeks and some or months to live, you take their T cells out reprogram them and re-inject them once. This is just one infusion, no chemo, no radiation therapy, and their disease just vaporizes. Wow. And this uh, is this is truly amazing. Um, and there's so much that you just said in a very short period of time, and I, I gotta kind of back up a little bit. You were on enough. CNBC. You were quoted as saying, or on CNBC you said, we see a tsunami coming in immuno-oncology, cancer is running scared. Is that, is that right? That is true. And uh, the CAR-Ts are one of those types of immunotherapy. There's others that I worked on when I was uh, director of global oncology at Merck. But the, the tsunami really is the understanding that the immune system can be harnessed and that we understand how to manipulate it to the benefit of patients to treat not just bloodborne cancers, but a very broad spectrum of solid tumors that also don't respond to conventional therapy. And the tsunami is an appropriate um, phrase, I think, because cancer therapy has evolved in waves over the decades, starting with conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy in the 60s, combining those agents, newer cytotoxic agents like cisplatinum and taxol, uh, a wave that was driven by my friend and colleague Brian Drucker at Oregon Health Sciences University for kinase inhibition, which puts chronic myeloid leukemia into abeyance. And there's now dozens of kinase inhibitors that are approved by the FDA for treatment. This is the next wave. And the, the interesting thing, Stan, about this wave is that it focuses not on the cancer cell. We're not sequencing the cancer cell to find out what the mutations are. We're not giving cytotoxic treatments that are a little more to toxic for cancer cells than they are for normal cells, mm -hmm. but not a lot, hence the side effects. Here we're targeting the host's own immune system. All wow. we're doing is trying to activate the immune system and we're finding that if you can do that effectively, 
you don't need any of the rest of that. I mean, virtually all of us have been touched by, by cancer in some way in our families. My, my father died of, of kidney cancer. And <clears throat> when I heard you say this is an alternative to conventional therapies, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to get up and hug you because the, the therapies seem to be as bad as the disease. That's right. And uh, sometimes the treatments are as bad as the disease. And there are individuals with cancer who will die. Ultimately, if you have uh, metastatic epithelial cancers, like kidney cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, etc., once it's metastatic, we can treat it. But until recently, we haven't been able to cure those diseases. So the idea that you can take immune cells and move towards that type of therapy is just uh, that type of outcome is just fantastic. Tell us about Fred Hutch. Fred Hutch was, as I mentioned, was founded uh, 40 years ago. Uh, it was founded by Dr. Bill Hutchinson, who was the brother of Fred Hutchinson, who uh, was a major league baseball player and coach. So as far as I know, we're the only cancer center in the world that's named after a baseball player. He unfortunately, Fred, uh, died at a young age um, from cancer, uh, which drove his, um, his brother Bill to build the institute. We focus primarily on cancer therapy and research, but we have very broadly based researchers and investigators. We have the, uh, we're the center of the largest program for developing vaccines for HIV, have a lot of expertise in infectious disease. We have a tremendous public health uh, sciences division that's had a major impact on women's health. So the, uh, and we have a global presence that includes now a site that we opened in Kampala, Uganda for treatment of cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're trying to do our part as a citizen of the uh, international community to help patients that have cancer. And just a minute ago, when you were talking about the, the therapies that you're working on here, um, uh, particularly the CAR T cells, there was an excitement in you. I could, I could tell that. Tell us about uh, Gary Gilliland. I uh, trained in medicine on the East Coast. I moved out uh, to Boston to train at Harvard Medical School and Dana Farber Cancer Institute in 1984. I promised my wife that we'd move back no longer than six years after starting, and we stayed there nearly 30. But I uh, was a professor of medicine at Harvard and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And at the time that I started studying cancer, uh, w which was born of an experience with a, a woman, young woman with beautiful children and family that died of leukemia, uh, that we had to develop better treatments for leukemia and for other types of cancers. But at the time I started, uh, which was not so long ago, we didn't know anything about the genetic basis of the disease. We didn't know the mutations that caused cancer. It was actually very difficult to identify them in those days before the next generation DNA sequencing technologies came into play. We, we identified dozens of genes that caused cancer. Some of them were actionable and it was a very exciting time. But I realized at some point that in academic environments, you, you can publish papers and you can clone genes, but the question is, are you having an impact on patient outcome? You know, had I done something that would make a difference in the life of that woman who died uh, that I took care of back in the 1980s? And uh, what I realized, and I, I think this is even more true in retrospect, is that the drug development is done extremely well in the pharmaceutical industry. And there's often been a bit of a tension between academics and pharma. I think actually that's coming together in a way that's mutually beneficial. But I went to Merck to learn how to make drugs to treat cancer. And I learned a, a huge amount. I had an academic hubris that I thought I knew exactly how this worked. And I'll tell you, Stan, it's, uh, and, and many do, once you get inside and understand how challenging and how difficult that is, you have a whole new appreciation for what it takes to take a target uh, that you want to uh, get a drug for and take it all the way through to the FDA uh, to register it for treatment of patients. My intent and my hope had been to come back into an academic environment uh, to try to bring that insight into these novel therapies that we were developing. And at Merck, I worked on a different type of immunotherapy that also activates the immune system and was approved by the FDA in nearly record time uh, within three years after the first um, patient was treated with the drug and realized that this is the time to be at a place like the Fred Hutch where we can take this long-standing history of interest and expertise in immunotherapy based on marrow transplantation that Dr. Don Thomas invented when he was here, received the Nobel Prize for, and convert that into curative therapies for patients that have not just blood-borne cancers, but a wide variety of solid tumors. You have used the word curative a lot. 
what I'm hearing is that it's you know it's not the long-term treatment; it's it's a cure. So, what is what is the patient like after the cure happens? Well, um, for patients, and my colleagues are appropriately cautious about and judicious about using the word cure. Um, I'm much more forthright and proactive. You're I, I really know, out there. I know what I see. And uh, as, as I was saying earlier when we were talking, I've, I've been in this business for, uh, well, not a business. I've been in the, had a career in cancer research for 30 years, and I've never seen anything like this. We've the, the euphemism that oncologists often use for these types of cancers I was just talking about is that we can treat your cancer. But the, the underpinning of that is we can treat your cancer, but we are almost certain we can't cure it. Those times have changed, and I never used to talk about cures for cancer in my grants and my papers and any public venues that I was in until just a few years ago when we began to see that happening when I was at Merck and seeing that happen here at places like the Fred Hutch. And to your question about what happens after the cure, um, in the case of the CAR T cells, the cells are infused. There may be side effects, sometimes serious side effects, that are the consequence of um, this rapid activation of the immune system. Uh, it's sort of like unleashing a storm in the body that goes out and fights these cancer cells, causes them to explode. So there, there can be side effects that relate to the efficacy of the treatment. What does all that mean? Those are big words. It means basically that there are side effects in the short term from these treatments. Uh, well, what kind of side effects? Am I going to grow another nose? Uh, no, but you, you may develop fevers, uh, sometimes high spiking fevers. Uh, you can have some impact on various of your organ systems, um, like your lungs, for example, with these types of treatments. In almost every case, those are reversible, so it's a matter of getting people through those side effects if they occur. And then once that storm is passed, the tumor is gone, people go back and have a, a normal lifestyle. And I think the other important point about this is, though, even though we're now treating people only after they've not responded to every therapy that we have, because this is new and investigational, so we want to make sure they get the best standard of care treatment, mm -hmm. that um, there are long-term side effects from cytotoxic chemotherapy. It can cause secondary cancers. Uh, the, the radiation therapy can do the same thing. And there are other side effects that can also involve long-term organ dysfunction, like pulmonary dysfunction, mm -hmm. lung function. So what I'm hearing you say <clears throat> is that this approach, this CAR-T approach, is a replacement for chemotherapy. It's a replacement for radiation. It's a replacement for all those things. It, Stan, it, it could be. Uh, we haven't. Th the formal test of that would be to take it right up front and use mm -hmm. that as an initial therapy for somebody that has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We're not quite there yet because we can cure the majority of uh, children, at least, that have ALL. So you wouldn't want them to, to deprive them of a curative treatment. But we also know the long-term sequelae in those children who survive are enormous. Most of them have heart dysfunction. Many of them have cognitive uh, disabilities from being two years old and being treated with mm -hmm. cancer therapies. They're short in stature because the chemotherapy freezes their growing bone uh, plates. So there are long-term consequences in the people who do survive the treatment. Our hope is that we can bring these CAR-T therapies forward and treat without the long-term consequences of these cytotoxic agents. You know, out, out there right now, people who are, are watching this, parents who are watching this, you know, usually I would ask this at the end of the show, but i got to ask it right now, is, you know, <clears throat> when and how do I, you know, contact Fred Hutch to see if I can have this for my child? Well, uh, we have a website that lists contact information for the Fred Hutch. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get this information up on the screen. So let's go back good. then. And so let me ask it this way. Is this uh, a natural progression in the research that has been done over the past 30 years, or is this something completely new? That's a great question. This is a natural progression, and it, it's a culmination of decades of work by investigators here and at other centers to understand um, how T cells are activated. Uh, as importantly, how are they turned off? We understand now that tumors can turn off T cells, and we have ways to block that effect. But they know how to kill tumor cells. They've got all the machinery for that. Their challenge is in recognizing the target, and that we're basically putting in a targeting device with these genetically engineered receptors. 
that's taken also decades of work to understand how to engineer the receptors. When we say chimeric, we mean that there's multiple different molecules that are sewn together and then engineered into the fabric of the T cell to enable it to kill the tumor cells. So it's, it's been a, a, a logical progression and I think it's been the dream of investigators in this field for a long time. And finally, when we got to the point where we could enable the technological advances, we're seeing the clinical responses that uh, are so spectacular. This is my own cells that you're, that you're taking. You're not introducing something foreign into my body. You're just taking my own cells and helping them be smarter? Yes. In the case of uh, the CAR-T therapy, we're taking your own cells. It's the ultimate personalized medicine. We're taking your T cells. We're educating them on how to kill your tumor, and we're reintroducing them. Now, one important point is that so far we've demonstrated this works in a specific type of bloodborne cancer, um, the, a certain type of lymphoid malignancy, leukemias, as well as lymphomas. We don't yet know whether this will be effective in treating solid tumors. We're working very hard on that, as others are, but I think there's uh, an open question about the extent to which this will work in solid tumors, understanding that we have about a 93% complete response rate in people that have acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That 93%? 93%. These are people, Stan, that were dying, that, that literally have weeks or months to live. We do know, however, um, and this is work that I did at Merck that uh, targets the activation of T cells by, um, in essence, turning off the signals that tumor cells provide that turn the T cells off. It's a negative of a negative, but um, those types of mechanisms where we give antibodies that take the brakes off of the T cells, those do work in solid tumors. They induce responses in a majority of patients that have malignant melanoma. Uh, about 20% of patients that have non-small cell lung cancer. It's actually very effective in renal cell cancers of the sort that your father had. Uh, just a single agent treatment. Wow. One treatment. The, uh, in, the, in those instances, there are multiple treatments that are given over a period of weeks. The um, investigators are trying to understand how long you need to go with the treatment, but we anticipate that it's not going to be a lifetime of treatment the way it is for most types of chemotherapies that we use. Well, in, in research, I mean, you having been in research for 30 years, is, does this surprise you that, that the, it's the strength of someone's own human body and their own immune system? It does surprise me. And I, I wish I could tell you that um, I was smarter than I am, but I think I was one of many people who were skeptical about this mechanism. I mean, when you think about how absurd it is to say, yeah. I'm just going to activate your immune system and it's going to take care of the rest. It just seems like that's almost uh, delusional thinking. So uh, I'm, I'm not only surprised, but I'm stunned by the efficacy of these mechanisms when it comes to these types of cancers. And we, when you care for patients that have um, widely metastatic solid tumors, you, you do anything you can to make them comfortable. We focus a lot of attention on end-of-life care and comfort for the family. How do you want to approach your ultimate uh, demise and death. And that's one of the arts of being a medical oncologist. This begins to flip that on its head a little bit because we can begin to talk with people about ways that we can have an impact that's... It, we have a lot of work to do. It doesn't work in everybody. But what about the same? Why not? We're not fully sure in some cases. Uh, there are 7% of patients that don't respond that have ALL, so we need to understand that. Uh, we've looked at different possibilities and we're beginning to unravel uh, some of the, the rationale for why people don't respond initially. There are um, some people who also will relapse. It looks in some cases as though that's because the T cells that we gave, even though they have the potential to live uh, lifelong in our body, uh, sometimes they don't live forever. We're trying to understand why that they didn't learn their lesson well enough, is that it? We didn't educate them properly. It's not, it's not their fault. I think it's our <laughs> fault, but yeah, exactly. Um, immunotherapy, that's a, that's a bigger thing. Immunotherapy has been around for quite some time. It has, and that's a very good point. It's a, um, it's a very broad field. So we've talked about the chimeric antigen receptor T cells. That's one form of immunotherapy. The other form that I was describing is uh, focused on what are called uh, immune checkpoint regulators. And those medicines uh, target the T cell itself. 
they're off the shelf. You don't have to take a person's cells out. You simply give an antibody that flips the switch on T cell activation. But other forms of immunotherapy uh, that are tried and true include naked antibodies. Uh, there's a drug called rituximab, for example, that can be used to treat B cell malignancies similar to the ones that we're using CAR Ts for. They're not curative, but you can put toxins onto antibodies. Uh, that would be a form of immunotherapy. Uh, it's the one that doesn't sound particularly pleasant, though, because what I'm hearing is that you, in order to cure me or in order to treat me, are putting toxins in my body. Yeah, and that's been the mainstay for, um, for cancer treatment for all these decades, is mm -hmm. that we've found drugs that are more toxic for cancer cells than normal cells, sometimes marginally more toxic. So there are side effects. It's the hair loss. It's the infections from the lowering of your blood count that... Uh, and sometimes longer-term side effects from those toxic treatments. Which brings up the question, is it worth it? That's a good question. Is it, you know, would you, if you had metastatic cancer, would you take any medicine? And I think that's an individual decision that, uh, in general, our, our profession is very supportive of uh, providing options for patients and then letting them pursue the course that they want to. And there are some circumstances where if you had widely metastatic cancer and you're uh, elderly and infirm and have other side effects uh, or other health care issues, you might decide not to move forward with treatment. And that's what happens with any technology like this is that you, you get the first signal, and this is a spectacular signal. Mm -hmm. There's always ways to improve it. How do you make sure that everybody responds? How do you understand resistance and how to override resistance? If the T cells die off in some period of time, how do you keep them living longer? If they cause too many side effects, can you try to dial them down uh, by putting in tunable um, genetic codes? So th there's a lot of work that we need to do around that. But when you have an effect size that's so spectacular where you're having a 93% response rate in a patient population whose response rates to anything is going to be close to zero, the FDA has been very proactive about trying to move those through the approval pipeline. They have a, an approach that's called breakthrough status where when a drug's identified as having breakthrough potential based on the kinds of results we're talking about, even small numbers of patients, they'll accelerate the process towards approval, understanding that after the drug's approved and it's out there for all patients that you need to do a lot more work to understand its safety and its efficacy. But uh, this CAR-T um, has been approved as a breakthrough drug uh, and is going through the registration path, so hopefully one day soon that'll be approved as a drug um, for use by all patients. You don't see this as just for cancer, though, do you? Great question. Uh, we're thinking about activating the immune system, understanding how it's both activated and turned down, activating it to the benefit of cancer patients to try to kill tumor cells. The, the reverse side of the equation, and actually some of the side effects that we see, uh, relate to autoimmunity, that if you overactivate the immune system, that causes um, a whole spectrum of diseases uh, that are not well understood in general, but they include things like rheumatoid arthritis and uh, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, um, ulcerative colitis, uh, scleroderma, very challenging diseases to treat. They're the other side of the equation. That's the yin and the yang, is that uh, autoimmunity is your immune system doing too much. Uh, and your body's caught as collateral, and there's damage as a consequence of that. So if we can amp up the immune system, we also have tools that should allow us to amp it down. And mm. those might be useful for treating autoimmune but disease. But we as individuals can also do something to help our immune system become healthy. It, and that's not something that I learned in health class when I was in school many years ago. Is that something that should be, be taught? I, I think what you just alluded to, the I mean, good health practices in general are good for our immune system as it is for the rest of our body. I'd also want to be cautious about uh, that there are a lot of um, uh, homespun remedies out there, some of them commercialized, um, that tout the potential for activating the immune system or for your immune health. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying that they don't work. I'm saying that we don't really have evidence that says that there's any one approach that you could take um, that's going to activate the immune system, whether it's a, a naturalistic medicine or a homeopathic approach or vitamins, etc. But there's no question, though, that, that uh, a, a person stands a better chance in fighting disease if their immune system is healthy. That's absolutely correct. Um, you talked about commercialization, and the cynical part of me says, okay, so here we are, we've got this wonderful you know, potential. 
uh, <clears throat> are we going to see a fight for the money side? Basically, are the, the pharmaceuticals going to glom in and you know delay this for years? Is there a way they can make money off of it? All those kinds of questions. Yeah, I think the uh, and having been in the pharmaceutical industry, you understand uh, what their business model is. It is a for-profit business. The, there's a huge amount of uh, dollars that are invested in research to help support um, the process for drug development, and they need to stay in business. And I'll tell you that that's something that's not done well in academic centers, drug development, for all kinds of reasons. I do think that um, if you look just at cost-effectiveness, though, and just think about it from a healthcare uh, system perspective, if you have a, a medicine uh, where you give one injection and it's curative, and balance that against the cost of let's say three years of treatment with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which is standard for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the value proposition just from a health cost effectiveness is very clear. It's going to be much, much less expensive. Uh, and the pharmaceutical companies uh, will make a profit. Um, and there's always some debate about whether those treatments that have curative intent are worth $100,000. Are they worth more than that? One recent example that doesn't have to do with cancer was around hepatitis C. There's now a treatment that's curative for most patients with hepatitis C, which is a huge problem worldwide, 100 million, 180 million cases worldwide. It costs about $80,000 for that treatment uh, over a period of 16 weeks. There's a lot of complaint about how much the companies that manufacture that generate for pills, basically, that don't cost that much to manufacture. But if you compare the cost of that to the cost of progressive liver failure, cirrhosis, liver transplantation, that's just a fantastically uh, cost-effective treatment. I think that's the direction these treatments will go in. Uh, I also think that your point's well taken, though. It's you can make if a pharmaceutical company can make a lot more money on a drug that has to be given for a person's entire life, e even if they ultimately die from complications of their disease. If you give one treatment and you cured the disease, you know, what's the business model around that? And you don't make as much money with those types of drugs. And I don't think that matters to the pharmaceutical companies. I know I can speak for the perspective we had at Merck, which is that that's not the important thing. We'll make enough to make sure that we can subsist. But it's not about trying to profiteer, even though there's been some debate about that in the lay press. We only have 30 <coughs> seconds left. What's next for Fred Hutch? Well, we're, we're looking to expand um, our repertoire in immunotherapy. Uh, we have other uh, really interesting and exciting programs for cancer treatment, but as it relates to immunotherapy, to expand beyond CAR T cells into immune checkpoint regulation, we didn't talk about vaccines, but therapeutic vaccines may be something that we, uh, we would want to pursue. And most importantly, trying to understand the power that we, we haven't quite got the reins on this horse. I mean, it, it's a very powerful treatment. Um, we need to learn how to control it a little bit better and try to ensure that we can not only treat bloodborne cancers, but try to treat solid tumors as well. Wow. That's been Dr. Gary Gilliland from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Be sure to go to the website for, uh, for your questions. I'm really excited about this. I hope you are too.